The first evolutionist to take up the issue of the origin of life in the 20th century was the Russian biologist Alexander Oparin. His aim was to explain how the first living cell, the alleged common ancestor of all living beings according to the theory of evolution, could emerge. In the 1930s, Oparin formulated a number of theories to show how the first living cell could arise from inanimate matter by chance. However, his efforts ended in failure, and Oparin himself had to confess. Evolutionists that followed Oparin conducted experiments to find an evolutionist explanation to the origin of life. The most famous of these experiments was conducted by the American chemist Stanley Miller in 1953. Miller obtained a few simple organic molecules by triggering a reaction among gases that he claimed would have been present in the primitive Earth atmosphere. At the time, this experiment was regarded as a scientific proof for evolution. It turned out to be no such thing at all. Later discoveries showed that the gases used in the experiment were very different from the gases that had been present in the early atmosphere of the world. Miller himself eventually admitted to the invalidity of his experiment. Every evolutionist attempt in the 20th century to account for the origin of life has ended in failure. Jeffrey Beta, a professor of geochemistry and a leading advocate of the theory of evolution, confesses this fact in the February 1998 issue of Earth. Today, as we leave the 20th century, we still face the biggest problem that we had when we entered the 20th century. How did life originate on Earth? Of course, such an amazing structure could never have been formed by chance. The theory of evolution, which sees life as the result of mere coincidences and haphazard happenings, is helpless to explain anything in the face of the incredible complexity of DNA. What might our DNA reveal about the origin of modern man? Just because we cannot decipher 95% of our genetic material doesn't necessarily mean that that 95% is in fact useless. Nature is extremely efficient. DNA is the most powerful storage device in the universe. Not even with all the supercomputers combined in the world could we store as much information as we could store on DNA. As remarkable as the universe itself is, our genes, our DNA, is what is truly remarkable. When we look at the minute, we find that there is little to no difference between the spin of an electron and the maelstrom of a black hole. Is this coincidental or is this designed? Were human beings designed to hold consciousness or did consciousness design human beings? Every detail of a living being's physical and physiological makeup is coded in this double helix. All the information about our bodies from the color of our eyes to the structure of our internal organs and the shape and function of our cells are programmed in sections called genes in the DNA. The DNA code is made up of the sequence of four different bases. If we think of each one of these bases as a letter, DNA can be likened to a data bank made up of an alphabet of four letters. All the information about a living thing is stored in this data bank. Many evolutionists like to adhere to the theory of panspermia, which means essentially that a asteroid with algae and bacteria on it smashed into our planet many years ago, and here we are. This theory is more preposterous than the theory that we evolved from chimps, and simply a continuation of it. It's preposterous. All matter originates and exists only by virtue of a force 
which brings the particle of an atom to vibration and holds this most minute solar system of the atom together. We must assume behind this force the existence of a conscious and intelligent mind. This mind is the matrix of all matter. We have to learn that most of our knowledge in religion is wrong, except one thing, there is creation, there is what we call God in all respect. And we have to learn by religion, we are very teeny little beings in this gigantic universe. Why God is absolutely unexpressible. It's so gigantic, it's so wonderful. So we would never lose God when we continue to think of extraterrestrials. God becomes bigger. Is it really possible that humans evolved from bacteria growing in some sort of primordial ooze? Or were we intelligently designed by a higher power? We all begin as a single cell the size of a period at the end of a sentence. How does that cell know how to build a, a body with 100 trillion uh, cells in it, thousands of different kinds, and each one of them is so complex, nanochemical machinery beyond our comprehension how it works, and encoded is the instruction manual. It's the manufacturer's manual how to build and operate every part of this incredible body made up of a hundred trillion cells. Furthermore, DNA is a three-dimensional molecule that is self-replicating. Each molecule is able to make an identical copy quickly and efficiently. The Lord has even programmed DNA to detect and correct replication errors. These sophisticated capabilities far exceed man's means. God has created the DNA molecule in such a way that it is self-correcting. There are special proteins called enzymes that go up and down the DNA molecule looking for and making repairs on a minute-by-minute, second-by-second basis. God created us with a DNA code that actually has what we call editase or editorial type enzymes. Just as an editor reads a newspaper or a book looking for mistakes, so God has created special enzymes enzymes that go up and down our DNA molecule repairing the mistakes in ways that are unbelievably complex. Tell me, how old is the Earth? How did we come to be? What was it that fused the elements to create consciousness and cellular life? Four basic units called nucleotides combine into a code for 20 amino acids. From those few amino acids, the body forms more than 100,000 proteins. Oh my goodness. So the odds of building even a short functional protein by chance alone is 74 plus 40. You can, remember how you do this in math? You can add the exponents if you're multiplying exponential numbers. 164. Thank you very much. Okay. Wow. Now, can anyone get their mind around a number that big? There's only 10 to the 80th elementary particles in the entire universe. There's only 10 to the 16th seconds since the, the Big Bang. There's only 10 to the 139th total events since the, the beginning of the universe. Now, now you're starting to get the uh, understanding of why people are very skeptical that the chance hypothesis is, is going to do the job. Now, you may have heard just the opposite. Has anyone ever gotten in a discussion with you about the origin of life and said, hey, it happened by chance? I mean, do you hear that? But if Darwin's theory of natural selection cannot account for the appearance of intelligent, hairless homo sapiens, what can? Unfortunately, Darwin's theory of evolution provides us with no real usable answers, as it is so skewed by lack of technology or scientific understanding. It was really more of a politically and religiously motivated theory. A hat trick is a magic trick so complete, it is based on the perfection of threes in a row. The term was first coined in 1858, but it was not until the next year when Charles Darwin 
purposed the practice with his hypothesis of evolution, that pure flat earth thinking at its very core was presented. The remarkable thing is that since 1859, for the last 155 years, it has been the completely incorrect yet dominant explanation for the origin of life on planet Earth. Fortunately, science and modern physics have been able to finally recover the truth. The theory of evolution that was advanced in the 19th century denies this evident fact of creation. This theory holds that the species on Earth were not created by God, but came into being as a result of processes governed entirely by chance. The founder of this theory was an amateur naturalist named Charles Darwin. Darwin expounded this theory in his book, The Origin of Species, which was published in 1859. Darwin's book was an instant success, but his popularity was due more to the ideological implications of the book rather than its scientific worth. Darwin's ideas provided considerable support for the materialistic philosophy which denied the existence of God. The founder of dialectical materialism, Karl Marx, dedicated his book Das Kapital to Darwin and wrote on the cover, to Charles Darwin from a devoted admirer. Darwin's theory argued that all species descended from a common ancestor by means of little cumulative changes in long periods of time. Darwin could advance no sound evidence to prove this claim. Indeed, he was himself aware of the great many facts that invalidated his theory. He admitted these in his book in a chapter entitled, Difficulties on Theory. Darwin's hope was that these difficulties would be overcome by new scientific discoveries. But in fact, advances in science would refute Darwin's claims one by one. Darwin proposed that all species evolved successively from a common ancestor. But how did that first living thing come into being? Darwin did not address this question at all in his book. He was not even aware that this point was one of the biggest refutations of his theory. The primitive understanding of science in his day assumed that life had a very simple structure. According to a theory called spontaneous generation, which was popular since the medieval age, it was believed that living things could easily arise from non-living matter. It was commonly thought that frogs spontaneously arose from mud and bugs from food leftovers. And some curious experiments were designed to prove these theories. A handful of wheat was left on a rag and mice were expected to arise from the mixture. The maggots on meat were also taken as evidence that life could generate from non-living matter. But later it was understood that such maggots did not form spontaneously, but that they emerged from microscopic larvae deposited on the meat by flies. And in Darwin's time, the belief that microbes could emanate easily from non-living materials was very common. Five years after the publication of The Origin of Species, the famous French biologist Louis Pasteur scientifically refuted these myths that lay ground for evolution. After lengthy studies and several experiments, the famous French biologist Louis Pasteur refuted the foundation that lays ground for the theory of evolution. Due to this primitive level of science at the time, the imaginary scenarios of the theory of evolution were not looked upon as odd at all. Darwin's theses had a great impact on the scientific circles of his day. However, Darwin was still distressed. In the chapter, Difficulties on Theory, he wrote, If it could be demonstrated 
that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down.